Welcome back to the first team. I'm Joe DeLeon. With me is my co-host, NFL Draft Analyst for A to Z Sports, Ryan Roberts. Today we're moving on to our next position group ranking show for summer scouting. If you missed any of those other ones, go back, listen, watch wherever you're tuning in. Hit subscribe, give us a five-star review, show us a little bit of love. But today we're doing the interior offensive line class, talking guards, talking centers. We typically mix these two. It gets a little muddled sometimes with these conversations, but today is a bit necessary for doing that because, Ryan, I said to you, mm-hmm. I, I don't like my list. I think that there's five really nice players. I think there's five really good players that starts to really work its way up to the top two. We've got some really quality guards. But barf, man, barf on like this whole back end. I, I'm almost tempted. Can I just read a top eight? I don't want to read it. No, you got to read top ten. You got to read top uh, ten. Oh man, could uh, you imagine, Joe? Let, let me paint a different universe where you mm. we would have had to do a top ten centers class for. I don't think that would have been possible. That would also have been a painful waste of time trying to watch we, ten centers in this class. We we would have we would have. I mean, I'll be very honest. Okay, so three of my top ten are centers. After that, I'm probably talking about a lot of PFA types in this class overall. Like, it's just, this is kind of my viewpoint of this interior offensive line class. It's just why it was really good that we combined the two, especially this year, because I do think it's a quality guard class. I even think it has the potential Mm. to be a good guard class. Center class, I think, is bad, guys. Like, this is one of the, we'll see how guys develop throughout the season and some late risers. Like this time last year, we weren't talking about Jackson power Johnson for either, for instance. Right. right? So like things happen, but right now, as of today in July of 2024 for the 2025 NFL draft class, this is a bad center class. Like they just call what it is. So we have a solid to good guard class in my opinion, and we have a bad center class. So put it together. It's not the most impressive group of all time, but it's going to be fun to talk about these guys, man. There'll be a couple under the radar guys. Uh, I think people need to figure out, Joe. They need to find out about. I know there's one guy that I have on here that you're going to really hate because I told you I wasn't high on him and I didn't think he was going to be in my top 10, but he ended up in here. I'm higher on him than than you are. So I'll go ahead and read mine, my 10 through 6. Feel free to yeah. cover your ears as you listen to this. <laughs> Number 10, Cooper Mays from Tennessee, the center. Uh, Number nine, I really don't think that this guy is going to be in this class because he is severely underweight, but he ended up landing in here because I had a bit of a developmental grade on him and it was good enough for him to end up uh, ranked where he was. Parker Brailsford, who is the now Alabama center, formerly of Washington, very, very small. He is number nine for me. Number eight, Josh Fryer from Ohio State. Your boy, uh, Ernest Green from Georgia is number seven, the projected guard. And then number six, Joshua Gray from Ohio State, who I guess is more of a center, but could could maybe Oregon play State, guard you mean? if you needed to. Oregon State. You said Oregon State. Ohio State. Ohio State. Oregon State. Sorry, Dude, Joshua oh Gray. My God. Oregon State. I, I forgot to regrade Joshua Gray. I literally have graded him like two straight off seasons. I forgot to regrade. He's not him in here. I you didn't to, put I, him in I, here. I don't have a grade oh. on him right now. I don't have a grade on him right now. Now I don't so. have a very good grade on him. By the way, that just he, uh, I have a fourth on him. I, I think I was a number. similar wavelength last off season. I actually kind of mm. like him as a developmental center because he plays left tackle yeah. for Oregon State. But like he's a really smooth athlete. Like he can move well and he moves it's well. Not, laterally. He's not very. Like, He's not very strong, but you know he can yeah. he can get around pretty. He he very he he messes up on a ton of reps, and he he loses a lot of reps because he's just not long enough to be playing no. left tackle. And I don't know why they're putting that poor poor kid all the way out there. He should be playing inside. I mean, if if you <laughs> if you saw the bowl game against Notre Dame where they didn't have they didn't have um, Talisi Fuanga either in that game. Mm. I think it was very obvious why why Gray has been playing left tackles because I don't think they have yeah. offensive tackles on that roster really, man. Like, unfortunately for him. But, yeah, I think there's some developmental track. He would definitely be in my top 10 if I had regraded him. But I just noticed I do not have a grade on Joshua Gray right now from Oregon State. So uh, You have more time than I do to to keep track well, of these I, things. So that's, I think, that's I, think totally I still have you. more guys graded than you, though, for this group. You absolutely so. do. You absolutely do. Uh, <laughs> who's your 10 through 6? Oh, uh, man, I wanted to ask you about your boy Parker's Brailsford, Brailsworth before oh, we uh, jump out. He's before. not on yours, I assume? I didn't grade him, dude. I just uh, He's like one of those guys that... I understand why some people like him in a vacuum. I get the long-term upside, but like 
I just don't see anything translatable right now to being an NFL football player, dude. Like, it's just so yeah. hard at 275 pounds. And that's still what he's listed at in Alabama, which is very troubling to me. Like, that is – I was hoping that he'd be, like, 290 on the roster right now, not to, 275. To be – to be perfectly clear, I'm not I'm not one of the folks that are that really like him. He might be six feet tall. He's like six one, roughly, it looks like on film. Way too lean. He was listed at two seventy five, and I, I don't think that there's truth to that. He was very, very, very undersized on film, lacking the power and the weight behind his ass to like really back it up. Yeah. But I think where you do not get excited, but think that, hey, this could work. Maybe this is a Sean O'Hara. Uh, Jason Kelsey type of center who's much smaller, shines sure. in a zone scheme. I mean, Tyler Linderbaum's not a super tall, long kid, but he moved really well. But he was he was able to produce some some power in, in short areas. But my thing with Brailsford, just such an easy, fluid mover, and I thought that he mirrored really well. Yeah. The, the upside does come from the fact that if he was 300 and had the power that he did, I'd be completely out on him. Yeah. Part of me thinks if he gets up to... 305, 295, or something along those lines, kind of like what we had with uh, Charles Grant, who mm -hmm. we acknowledged, hey, maybe if he adds a little bit more strength, we can really see and paint the picture of what he could be like in the NFL. Yeah, it makes sense. You, you know what? Do you know what's hilarious? I think I actually called him Parker Brailsworth. Do you know why that happens? Have you ever seen why? um have you ever seen um uh God, what's the guy's name? Burlsworth, the Burlsworth Award. Yes. So yes. The, the center that played at Arkansas, his name is is isn't it Parker? Isn't it Parker Burlesworth? Like, isn't that his name? No, I think um, something Burlesworth. Let's move on before we just keep. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm butchering. I'm butchering. Incorrect but, but names. I, I literally called it Burlesworth nice. because of Burlesworth. Burlesworth is hilarious. Parker also, Brailsford. I did not grade Ernest Green because I just don't Hater. think he's going to be a 2025 NFL draft prospect. I just, I don't think he is either. But I, I see the path. You and I completely disagreed on this this thing with with Ernest Green. I see where he could be a really good guard. But he, technically speaking, is all over the place. He is just—he's just an athlete out there. There, there were some people were posting some some clips I saw this week of him demolishing guys in space yeah. uh, while he, there were like screen passes thrown to the outside, and he was just blowing dudes up. So I, I see where he could be that type of a player, but he just needs to get more technically sound. You're 10 through 6. Give it, 10 give through 6. Number 10. Funny enough, Cooper Mays, center from Tennessee. Ah, number 10. Look at number that. 9. Garrett Dellinger, offensive guard from LSU. Number mm. 8. Eli Cox, center from Kentucky. Also played some guard this past year for a couple games. Jaden Roberts at number 7 for me from Alabama. And then number 6 is Donovan Jackson from Ohio State. I didn't get to Cox or yeah. the Alabama kid that you just mentioned because I was a tiny bit behind and they, they yeah. kind of popped on the radar late for when we were talking about watching those guys. But sure, um, uh, I'm trying to think it. What well, the LSU kid? What did you think of him? Dellinger. So Dellinger was a former like high four. I think he may have been a five star by a couple of platforms. Mm -hmm. I just think he's solid. Like, I don't think that there's anything special about him at all. I mean, he's listed. I think there's verified right around six foot five. He's 305, 310 pounds. Like he's a pretty densely put together kid. I think he's going to go under the radar a lot in just media circles because of the fact that he plays with Will Campbell, the fact that he plays with Emory Jones. I know a lot of people down there are really excited about the center, DJ Chester, who was a high caliber recruit in his own right as well. But I do think that this kid is a day three, gets drafted, and has enough functional athleticism and power to be a good swing player inside. So I don't think that there is like this massive upside. But, but I will say this, is if that Garrett Dellinger ends up being a low-end starter for a team for a couple years, I wouldn't be shocked because like he just does everything pretty well and he's functionally in the right spot most of the times. This is just, again, Joe, like if we're talking about proof of it not being a great interior offensive line class, Garrett Dellinger is usually probably a 10 to 15 type of kid or maybe even a little bit lower. A guy that is border or not. I think he's draftable. He's definitely a draftable football player. It's just the conversation of like what the upside is. He's much more hmm. of a floor player, which I think is a little bit to get excited about, which is actually the complete opposite of the Jaden Roberts kid who I had at number seven from Alabama. That kid is all tools and power and physical. He's a bull in the China shop, dude, but he has, 
he has no control right now, man. Like he gets over his skis way too much. He plays a little bit off balance, but like when he is able to fit inside and get his legs underneath of him, he's an absolute powerful dude, man, who creates a lot of power and some very tight windows. So Jane Robertson, number seven, I think he could be an elevator. Eli Cox, the kid that I mentioned from Kentucky, I think he's a little bit of Dellinger, except a little bit more athletic, in my opinion. He can mm-hmm. play guard. He can play center. He's one of those kids, again, that I just think he could be a starter, like a low-end starter in the NFL for a couple years. I don't think that he's a long-term plus starter necessarily on the next level, but like 6'4 plus, 300 plus pounds, pretty powerful, definitely plays through contact. Like He does well, especially on, on, some, on some combo opportunities to work to the second level. He's just, not, he's just a average NFL athlete for the position. All right, moving into my number five to start us off here as we go back and forth. You mentioned your number six is my number five. Donovan Jackson, the guard from Ohio State. I wasn't super high on him last cycle, but I thought he made a lot of improvements. Looked like he got in even better shape. He looks just like a muscular uh, force that they've got in the interior there. He generates a lot of power. I think that he's got great leg drive, lower body power. He's really able to redirect guys, displace them, move them off the ball. I thought also in pass protection that he had a pretty steady base, was able to really lock guys down because of his grip strength on on a number of reps. Overall, I'm not exactly excited with his ability to redirect, um, but I think that this is somebody who can step in just from the general power profile to start day one whenever he's drafted. Maybe not at a high level. Maybe his ceiling isn't as high as some of these other guys that we're talking about, but I could draft him somewhere at the end of the third round and feel pretty good about him Uh, being my starting guard as soon as he's a rookie. I I think he's going to be a solid starter on the NFL level more than Mm -hmm. more than likely, which is why I had him at number six. Like I Joe, this is my issue with him because I agree. Donovan Jackson has a lot of tools that you get really excited about. I mean, he's six, three plus he's got a very clean frame, even though he's over 300 pounds. I think he can still add a little bit more weight to his profile, which will even increase the power profile. The high end reps that he has are Really exciting, to say the least. But then I just think that he's a very inconsistent player with his approach, man. Like there's some times where I also think that he just kind of gets a little overzealous, a little over aggressive, and that can affect his balance a little bit. I do think that on the second level, he's a little bit hit or miss with his angles and his targets. But if he's able to become a little bit more of a a little bit more of a relaxed isn't the right word, but a little bit more of a patient offensive lineman, I think he has a lot of tools to really get excited about. It's just about let's rein it in a little bit and let's be a little bit more Mm -hmm. technically savvy because the raw tools are outside of maybe one or two guys on this list. He might have the best raw tools in this entire class. It's just about harnessing those raw gifts into technical prowess. When those two things meet, I think we are talking about a solid starter in the NFL level. We got a five. Oh, I'm going to butcher the kid's name, and I forgot to look up the uh, the YouTube pronunciation before we got on here, man. But I have from Washington State, Ba'alili oh. Bayamo is my best opportunity at this one. I think that that is probably Dude, butchered. I didn't awful. watch him either. I don't know how I ended There were so many freaking guys, and I ended up watching all the shit ones, apparently. So continue. <laughs> he is a starting right tackle for Washington State. And number 79, and I was actually going to look up his, I thought we had some measurements on him. Yeah, so he's six foot four, five eighths, 292 pounds. So he's a lighter guy right now. But he's got a really easy frame. I think that he could easily put on weights and not compromise athleticism. I do not think he's a tackle. And it's not a – well, I think his length is below average. But it's not a foot quickness thing. Like, I think his feet are actually good enough to play Mm an offensive tackle. But I do think that the best part of Fayamo is how I'm going to pronounce this name, even though that's probably incredibly wrong. He has the strongest hands that I've seen of any offensive tackle in this class or any offensive lineman in this class, Joe. He strikes, dude. And it is – it kind of takes you off guard a little bit because you're like, he's only 292 pounds. You're not expecting this kid to be super powerful. But the strength through his hands on his initial punch are awesome. Like he can really jolt defenders, can really create that – kind of create that vertical assertion in the run game, can really create movement at the point of attack. It's exciting, super exciting. And he's got good lateral mobility, man. I think his hip flexibility is pretty good. I think he works laterally well. I think he works the second level well. The big thing about this kid is a former defensive lineman that has only been playing Washington uh, offensive tackle, offensive line, for a very short window here. So mm-hmm. I'm excited 
to see what 2024 looks like. Because right now, at least on Blesto, Blesto had him with a third round grade right now or late third round grade in their system. So this is a kid that's well liked on the NFL level. I think he's a guard. Like there's no doubt about it in my mind because I think his his I think that his arm length is a little bit low uh, below average. I think he's an over aggressive player, so I'd rather have that aggressiveness inside than working patiently on an island. I just don't think that that's going to be the best opportunity for him, but I'm telling you right now that if this kid ended up being offensive guard 3 in this class or even higher potentially, I would not be shocked at all because this kid has all the tools. The biggest thing is, is that he's a defensive lineman, former defensive lineman. So his thought process, Joe, is I'm going 100 miles an hour every single rep, right? Every single rep. And as I said with Donovan Jackson, sometimes that can cause balance issues. Sometimes that can get you over your skis a little bit. Sometimes that can make you fall off of blocks because you are lunging a little bit. I don't think he lacks flexibility. I think he's over aggressive at times. And I think that right now his technique is a work in progress to say the least. But this kid's strike, this kid's lateral mobility, this kid's frame and developmental upside. I think that this kid is going to be potentially a top 100 pick, maybe even higher in this class. And I would not be shocked if this kid is a plus starting guard in the NFL before too long. Yeah, I didn't get eyes on him. Again, there's a long list of just random names. It seems like all the consensus lists that you pull up online, a lot of them, a lot of the ones are that are high up are not well, very good, well, which I and, fell for that trap. Well, and on the spring grades, which which makes it a little tricky for this kid, is that he is listed as a tackle. Bro. So unless you've seen him. Well, that him, was why I didn't watch yeah. him for this. I, I, I exactly. thought I just missed him for tackle, and I didn't include him in my tackles because there were so many to get to. So. Well, exactly. That's, well, that's what's and, a little... and that's my point is that most people would just see the list and just view him just as a tackle. And that's how they would grade mm-hmm. him. I watched him and I just think he rejects better inside. So like, it's no yeah. fault of you missing him because literally he's a tackle yeah. that's listed by a tackle by the NFL scouts as well. So yeah. my number four was the guy that you put me on to Brian Stevens, the center from the university of Virginia. I have a pretty favorable grade on him. I threw a, late second on him. So I, I'm willing to take this kid. And yeah. also the, the reason why I'm willing to take him that early is I know that his floor is so high that I could take him and start him right away. Not a super big center prospect. This is that Zach Frazier, Jason Kelly, uh, Jason Kelsey type of a prototype where understands leverage, understands how to get underneath guys, pads, knows how to ride his feet and take the right body angles to win in any, any circumstance. It's like watching a technician. He is the most refined interior offensive lineman in this class. We're talking about a lot of guys after him that are mostly upside or well, this is a six year senior, right? Like it's a six year kid. Yeah. This is a sixth year guy that has played a ton of football and it really, really shows Mm -hmm. he doesn't lose a lot of reps. And it's not because he's really strong and he's probably on the lower end of just general center strength that he brings to the position. But again, what makes him so good is understanding all right. If I put myself here, if I put my hand Mm -hmm. on this guy's hip, I know that I'm going to be able to redirect him and redirect his momentum, that I'm going to be able to win this rep. I know that he's got a little bit of an injury issue that plays into this, and he might end up, we might talk about him, and there's going to be some a-holes that that look at our lists and go, oh, what a bunch of idiots. This guy went late on day three. How could you rank him so high? It's like, well, you don't know the whole story, and you haven't been paying much attention. Very good football player. I hope that his hip situation is fine. Yeah. Yeah, so obviously deal, definitely dealing with some just kind of a injury past, right? So like that's going to compromise this this grade a little bit. But I also have a late second round grade on him, Joe. And I mm-hmm. keep asking people, where is he ranked for you? He is he's he's number four for me as well. So okay. we are we are a hundred percent on the same wavelength on this one because I just think. I think the Zach Frazier comp is just so easy, right? Because they're Mm -hmm. almost identical size. Like they really are. I guarantee the arm length. Was he also a wrestler? I don't think so. So, so here's the cool backstory on Brian Stevens, number 55 starting center. Now for the university of Virginia, for people that don't know, he was a 230 pounds offensive lineman, defensive lineman coming out of high school. Okay. 230 pounds. Joe, he didn't think he was going to play college football for a minute because he did just general lack of interest. Like the only the two biggest schools on him were Moorhead State and Dayton, right? And Dayton is obviously a much better program than Moorhead State, but Dayton is also a non-scholarship program on the FCS level. They're a Pioneer League team. So 
he's not getting money to come play there. Like literally the guys are going there to hopefully develop and to play football and play division one. Like that's cool, but it's on your own dime at the end of the day. So he takes mm-hmm. that le- leap of faith though. He ends up going to Dayton. He didn't commit to them until January of February of his se- of after his senior year. So like after national signing day, he decides that he's going to go to Dayton to play football. Like he's just going to go. So he played left tackle at Dayton played left guard at Dayton, uh, at Dayton. He played a little bit all over the place, but he had never played center before in his life. The first two games of this year for Virginia, they started him at guard. Then I think there was an injury, and they're like, hey, Steven, you got to go play center, right? And he talked about this on, on the podcast that we're going to drop, where Probably it was something next that he week. Had, That's going to be next week. Yeah, uh, so, something that he had never done, though. It, it's something that he would had never done in his entire life. And I thought he flourished with it, man, from pretty mm. much snap one until the end of the season. The great thing is if you watch him chronologically, I thought he got better too during the season. Like game one at center compared to game eight at center was just a completely different world. So I think he's coming into the year. He was an all ACC pick last year. I think he's going to be a firm ACC first team type of opportunity. I think he is the best senior center in this class without question. I think he's the best center in this class right now for me today. But there is going to be some concerns. Well, one, we have a small sample size. Two, we got some durability stuff. But this kid is smooth. Lateral mobility is awesome. I think he's really good with his hands. Dude, he technically is there. And I think he's a really smooth, good athlete for the center position as well. And I was told that he's now over 300 pounds. He played about 295 last year. So being over 300 pounds... There's, you're going to kind of start eliminating some of those size thresholds that some NFL teams hold as well. So if this kid's healthy and he's able to remain healthy, I think he's a plus starter on the NFL level at, 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 for a long term. It's just going to be about the durability stuff. But, man, I think he's good. I'm a big fan of Brian Stevens. Yeah, he might end up being a gem in this class that could be completely unrecognized throughout the entirety of this process. So we'll, I'm going to pay close attention to him. I'm excited that we even have an interview with him, which is – Super, super cool. My number three is, I actually, I might go sort of say that this might be my favorite interior guy I, and maybe I, one of I, my favorite prospects in the class. I know he, you know who I'm going to go with here. Yeah. Tate Radledge from Georgia. He is of the top three that I have the highest floor, in my opinion. I think there's more upside with the two other guys I'm going to get to in a second. But, man, he is a finisher. Like, he has yeah. the true guards mentality. He is wide as all hell super like well-filled out frame and he's just the epitome of what you want in a mauling finishing guard not a quick mm-hmm. easy light-footed redirector actually, and pass protection yeah but i think that he he makes up for that knowing how to use his body and his angles to keep guys in front of him he's one of those dudes just with pretty strong hands that just keeps interior guys in front of him and i really loved also just his upper body strength i thought he does a really good job of just not allowing his chest to get moved the reason why I say he's high floor, he's just generally not as athletic as some of these other guys. But I really think that you take him mid, early, second round, and you've got a really nice guard. Not one that maybe he never reaches that Pro Bowl level, but you've just got a really consistent guard that you feel good about for his entire rookie contract. And if you decide to re-sign him, to think to yourself, we're set there. He's just going to get the job done, and we don't really need to worry about him. Bet online remains your top spot for all of your live betting action and contests. NFL, college football, UFC, NHL are all in full swing. Bet online is your number one source for wagering news, odds, trends, and predictions with both desktop and mobile access at any time. Head to Bet Online today and use promo code Believe. That's B L E A V for fifty percent off your first deposit that is a 50 percent welcome bonus bet online where the game starts i was gonna say that i think that we're gonna have very similar top three here i know we have a, a no we're a, not well, well no we are because there's just gonna be one player that we're is not. exchanged for the other right so like well but we'll talk about it we'll talk about it. i, I yeah. know what's coming i know what's coming i'm not tr- i'm not gonna try mm-hmm. to let the cat out of the bag but I have Tate Ratledge at number three as well, Joe, out of Georgia. Okay. So I also have a late, I have a late second on him. Okay. So late mm. second, but I think that he could definitely elevate to a mid second, early second with a good season. I actually kind of liked his athleticism maybe slightly more than you did. I mean, there was a couple of plays where they were doing some, some pin and pull stuff for Georgia and he was working out in space. And I was actually kind of pleasantly surprised. I mean, for a guy that is verified 
at 6'6 six, six plus at 315 pounds who actually looks bigger than that. I didn't expect him to be a clean mover, but like I think that he's a sufficient mover. I think that he's pretty clean in his movements overall. But yes, physicality, downhill, double teams, combos, like doing that type of stuff. This kid is a people mover. Like there's no doubt about it. So I think that he is also a starting caliber offensive lineman. I think he could be a plus one on the NFL level. He just rem- he reminds me of like Kevin Zeitler, right? Who like Kevin mm, Zeitler? That's a really good. That's a really good comp. Ke- Kevin Zeitler's made. What about like Marshall Yonda? That's like another one that makes me. think Marshall of- was a little shorter though, right? Wasn't Marshall like six three yeah. and something out of Iowa? I think if I remember correctly, yeah. like Zeitler was like six five and some change. I think if I remember correctly, like not obviously that's just semantic mm-hmm. stuff, but. Kevin Zeitler was one of those dudes that I think he's made a couple Pro Bowls now at this point, but Kevin Zeitler has just been forever underrated for whatever yeah. reason, right? Like, you just don't talk about him because he doesn't play a flashy style. Like, he plays just a tough, physical style brand of football, and every team he's played on, he's been a plus starter. And he's got a couple Pro Bowl nods. Maybe that's in the future for Tate Ratledge, but either way, I think that you are getting a good starting offensive lineman for a long time that is going to be a little bit undervalued based upon the play style that he plays. Yeah, you can't. He's the perfect example, I think, of a prospect where you're just not going to go wrong. You know, you're good. Cooper Beebe. You know, he's a he's a slightly more athletic version, I think, of of Cooper Beebe. That's who it, I love it, Cooper it makes me. Cooper Beebe might yeah, start for Dallas of. in you as a rookie, by the way. Shocker. What a Which shock should. that is. Which he <laughs> should. He is the most Cowboys pick ever, and he might have been one of the most it pains me to know that he ended up with the Dallas Cowboys. My number two to stir things up, Tyler Booker. From Alabama. Look, I really like Tyler Booker. I just like my number one guy just a hair more because I'm I'm seeing the full picture on him. Oh no. Tyler Booker. You is fell into the SEC not only, homerism, dude. You fell into They're two it. SEC guys. What the hell are you talking about? They're yeah. both SEC guys. Yeah. Tyler Booker is so freaking exciting and fun uh-huh. to watch. I remember tweeting out not too long ago. Actually, it was a while ago, it was like two months ago when we first started watching guys. I tweeted out, I could watch Tyler Booker and pass pro all day because not only is he a really easy, fluid mover, but he's also one of those guys that delivers really heavy-handed blows, like will literally punch through your goddamn chest, that type of a guy. Yeah. I also think that he can finish as a run blocker and he could be a, a mauling type of a guy in the run game. The only thing that I was a little bit cautious on, mm-hmm. I just thought he was a little inconsistent with one, his body placement, his technique, where he's misfiring, he's missing guys. It leads to reps where he could really do damage to it just being almost a non-factor. And then one of those players who, for some reason, it bugs the hell out of me, he would be so good if he just drove his legs more consistently. Just a little bit too inconsistent with his leg drive. But, man, this is a kill shot assassin playing guard. Who would have thought a guard who's who's just destroying guys? Yeah, no, I'm a huge Tyler Booker fan. Tyler Buckner is number two for me as well, Joe. He's number two for me as well out of Alabama. Six oh, we do five. have similar lists. Yeah. Okay. I, again, right. I think that the the one guy, we, you have one guy on your list that I don't have, and I have one guy on my list that you don't have. That was the exchange that okay. I talked about. All right. Tyler Buckner, Tyler Booker listed at six foot five, 352 pounds. I want to tell you something that I think you're going to hate. Do you want to hear this? Mm-hmm. I was told yesterday by a source, we'll not, we'll not say the source's name, that dun, dun, dun. Tyler Booker is in the 325 to 330 range now this offseason, which I think you're so going to hate. So he's pulling a J.C. Latham. I, I mean, I don't know. Why I mean, would I hate that? I was, uh, I was because, happy. Because that I, I would think was that bigger. you would think that 325 is too light for Tyler Booker. That's what I thought that you would. Too light? Would. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, no. Wait, what was he listed at 352. last? 352. 352. Oh, I was looking at a different guy's weight. That's my fault. Yeah. I, I was, I had a, okay. Ah, and I was told, and I was I told that, that he no, was, I don't think that hurts me. I, I don't was think told that, that, that he was a legit, like 350 last year. Like he paid right around 350 pounds. And now he's down about 20, I don't think he needed pounds. to lose that weight. He didn't look sloppy. Did you? I, I think he needed to lose it a little bit. I remember we talked about this on a little bit on the episode. I think that his flexibility for a guy that played at 350 is outrageous, like absolutely outrageous. But why do you need to be 350? Like, I don't know why you need to be 350. Be a if big, you, bad MF or that's why. If he, I would have like if he would have been three thirty five, three forty, I would have still been fine with it, right? But I actually like that he's more in like the three thirty range because I think that his flexibility is going to take a massive step, which was already pretty good for his size, but I think that it's going to be extraordinary for his size now. 
I think that this kid has the raw power and overall explosiveness that it, that excites me. Like I have an early second round grade on him right now, but in a vacuum, mm. I could see him being a top 32 player for me right now. I actually think he could be a top 25 player for me right now. I think that he could be a legitimate first round player leaving the summer. But the cool thing about him, Joe, I don't think we've seen nearly the best of Tyler Booker because Tyler Booker just turned 20 like a month or two ago, dude. Like he's young cat. He's a young dude. He actually was a starting offensive tackle for IMG Academy when he was a junior he was the right tackle. J.C. Latham was the left tackle, which is just kind of hilarious to think about for any high school that had to play against IMG Academy that year. But I think that he has the requisite foot quickness and athleticism to be really good on the interior. I think he's a powerful dude. If you want an example of how good Tyler Booker can be, in my opinion, turn on the Texas A&M game last year. People this preseason are going to lose their minds over Walter Nolan because of the transfer portal and how much money he got and all that type of stuff. Here to tell you guys, and I've said this on the channel maybe two or three times at this point, Tyler Booker took that dude's lunch money that day. Took Walter yeah. Nolan's lunch money. Top yeah. on that game, and you'll see the best version of Tyler Booker. And if he's able to be a more flexible and explosive version than what we saw in 2023, I think this kid is a very good chance of being a first-round pick in 2024. 2025 NFL draft, I should say. So so now here's where the, the fire Off comes. The rails, because Off the you rails. Have, you have a guy who, I, Jonas Avenea, who I compared to – uh, Troy Fotanu that I think that while he's might get projected as a guard, I think that if, if Fotanu is supposed to be playing right tackle, he could play right tackle at a very high level in the NFL if he needed to. Maybe it's not his best position, but mm. as it's hard to find offensive linemen, there's a likelihood that that ends up happening where he does play tackle. Yeah. Emery Jones, on the other, the other hand, I don't want playing tackle. He is my number one guard because he is not super duper mobile in space. He, he gets beat by guys that are very quick uh, outside track edge rushers. Now, it had been pointed out to me by a number of people that there was a stretch where he was dealing with, I think, an ankle issue. So I, I'm trying to give him a little bit of room to improve this year in terms of his foot speed. But mm -hmm. where I was just blown away is something that we don't talk about enough with offensive linemen. It's that, that's his back strength. He He's one of those guys who... On pass protection reps, they run into him, and he yeah. like he. There's literally no movement in his he upper can, body. He can he press, right? Because he can press. He, yeah. he can yeah. not only can he press guys off, but if you've got a big, strong back as an athlete, mm -hmm. that means that you're just going to maintain your posture like nothing's happening. I yeah. think that this is brute rare power that he could bring to the guard position. I thought that I saw where he wasn't maybe enabled in this style of an offense playing tackle. He wasn't enabled to really drive guys off the ball for long rushing plays, but I think that he could do it in a very uh, power-based scheme, aggressive downhill rushing scheme in the NFL. It almost feels like he's not exactly the, the, the type of tackle or just type of player that would work in this spread scheme that Den Brock likes to run and that, uh, that Brian Kelly likes to run. But I, I thought that he was fantastic. I just think that with the way that he plays, the physicality, it's so translatable for him to being a, a high quality starting guard in the NFL. I so I don't I don't disagree. I just have him rated as a tackle for now, just because I do think that there's I had also heard the stuff about the ankle and being banged up a little bit. I'm just kind of in a wait and see mode with Emory Jones. Like Joe, there is raw tools, man. Like the 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 thing that we agree hundred percent on is that he might have the best anchor in this class. Like when he gets yeah. his feet dug in, he's got really strong hips. He's got a strong back. He's got strong upper body. Like he has all of those things that allow him to halt momentum and then press, which is, it's great. I mean, that's, that's really cool. I just need to see more from him at this point. I do. Th I will say this though. If I grade him as a guard, he would have definitely been a top five, top five interior offensive mm. lineman for me. Like, there's no doubt about it. I think that the tools are very translatable there. I just have heard there are mixed reviews. Well, not mixed reviews. There's a lot of good reviews for him as an NFL offensive tackle by NFL by the NFL right now. Like high grades as a tackle. So I'm just in wait yeah. and see mode. I gave him a grade for this for this season, and we talked about him. What, 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 you know, when we talked about the offensive tackles, and I talked about him as a top ten offensive tackle in this class. I'm just very interested to see what he looks like this year because, I mean, Joe, I imagine Joe Sloan is still going to be a spread-oriented player. I think it would be kind of silly for LSU to go away from the spread with how many athletes they right. always have at receiver. But overall, I'm just curious to see what he looks like this year, especially with 
such high opinions of him, right? There are so many high opinions coming out of this preseason that he's going to have a little bit of a target on his back along with his teammate, Will Campbell. So I'm just interested to see what, how, what step he takes in 2024. Number one for me? Number one? Yes. Uh, so I, I'm not going to really bring anything up with Sub and AI. I just kind of shared my spiel on him. Great, great yep. player. Moves really easily. What do you got on him? Six foot five listed, 330, 335 pounds. I th- I was told that he was actually more in like the 335 to 340 range last year, and he's actually lost a little bit of weight, so he's more in the 325, mm. 330. This kid just has every tool in the toolbox, though, that I look at, and I say, because I actually agree with you, Joe, and I remember we talked about this on the Offensive Tackle Show. I think there's a world where seven A could play tackle in the NFL. I just think that inside a guard, there's Pro Bowl upside. Like, I just ultimately do. He is... One of the best movers in this class. His foot quickness is fantastic. He has a developing power profile. He's an extremely young football player, so I still think the power is coming. But I'm telling you right now that when the power does come and his body maturity comes together with his game, this kid has every tool that to not even just play in an outside zone, inside, inside zone heavy scheme. Like If you're a gap scheme, I think that he could be a plus, plus, plus player in the NFL as well. I think it's a pro bowler inside. I think he could be a good, solid starting offensive tackle in the NFL level, which is valuable, but I think he's a pro bowl upside interior offensive lineman. So Jonah Savanea starting right tackle for Arizona, played a little bit of guard, played a lot of guard two years ago, played a little bit of guard last year. I think he's still scheduled to play offensive tackle this year, so I'm interested to see how the NFL ultimately values him positionally. Yeah, I I just keep coming back to – I don't disagree with any of that. I just keep coming back to – the fact that you know he's played tackle and Fotanu, we all thought guard, 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 guard would be a great guard, and then the minute he gets drafted, it's he might be playing right tackle for the Steelers. I, I, I just am so perplexed by the way that things trend in the NFL draft landscape, and I think it all just kind of comes to the fact that it's harder and harder than ever to find good linemen because good linemen need to be able to do so many more things than they had to in the past. It used to just kind of be put your head down and ram somebody into the ground. And now it requires these flexible, rare players to keep up with pass rushers. So maybe, maybe I I don't think either, neither one of us will be wrong in this situation. You know, it's just kind of going to be, what does the team that drafts him want him to do? Yep. At Joe DeLeon at rise and draft folks hit the subscribe button. Let us know in the comments what you think. We'll be back with more.